It's November 1918. Kaiser Wilhelm II has just abdicated his throne. The Ottoman and former Austro-Hungarian empires are quaking in their boots. The Spanish flu has replaced the Great War as the leading force of misery and death around the world. The Allied powers of France, the United Kingdom, Italy, the United States and Japan are beginning the process that will eventually lead to the signing of the Treaty of Versailles and the establishment of a new, albeit temporary, world order. Although Japan had seen comparatively little action compared to the other nations involved in the war, their support had proven invaluable to the Allies. The spoils, a scatter of formerly German territories, and the far greater prize of international recognition sat as a comfortable weight in the Emperor's pockets. But even at the treaty negotiations in Paris, even as the dust settled over the now empty battlefields across the globe, the Western powers were already peering over at Imperial Japan with a distinct suspicion that these new arrivals to the world stage weren't quite done making their impact. And they were right. Japan had already been unafraid to flex its considerable muscle in acquiring that aforementioned Pacific territory, despite foreign unease about Japan's expansion into China and their clearly greater ambitions. And Japan was under no illusions either. The Western nations had made no secret of their feelings on Japanese nationalism or on the divine right Emperor Hirohito claimed to bring all of Asia together under one central power. The United States in particular had already been pushing their luck, and though Japan politely acquiesced to President Wilson's request that they join the League of Nations, it became very clear very quickly that the racial equality Japan had hoped for would not be part of this new arrangement. Though, by this point, the writing was already on the wall. Between Japan and the West, things were going to go sour. The only questions were, just how long would that take, and just how bad would it get? Japan's Meiji era, lasting from 1868 to roughly the start of the First World War, was a time of incredibly rapid modernization for a nation that until very recently had adhered to a feudalistic societal structure with little influence from the outside world. Among other reasons for the change, Japan had learned that it was far outmatched by the power and military abilities of Western nations, making the archipelago a potential target for colonialist ambition. It was this mortal concern, along with a broader desire to achieve equality with Western nations, that guided Japan's transformation and made it into what it was. An all-out cultural, economic, political, and military sprint. One that somehow had to achieve this fundamental need for progress while also preserving the elements of Japanese identity that had long been essential. Early attempts by Japan to reassert their sovereignty against the Westerners who had already begun to set up shop were rebuffed. The major Western powers all agreed that they would not negotiate their treaties with Japan until Japan adopted a similar legal structure to their own, and after decades of reform during the early Meiji period, Japan was able to come to the table and have its demands met. As Japan wrestled for legitimacy among the major global powers of the day, it also turned its attention to neighboring countries and a rising desire to establish regional hegemony. At this time, China was the other local power to contend with, and both China's and Japan's attention was set first on Korea. After decades of diplomatic wrestling, the Sino-Japanese War of 1894 and 1895 demonstrated Japanese superiority on land and sea. And if you want to see a separate video about that conflict, absolutely let us know in the comments and we will oblige. After the war, Japan's condition for peace was just as harsh as any European's power might have been. Massive concessions in territory, tax exemptions, and crippling debt on the shoulders of the Chinese nation. But Japan's conquest and the resulting arrangements were not looked on kindly by the Westerners, who strong-armed Japan into ceding some of that territory back to China. Russia even leased out a naval base from China on what was ostensibly captured Japanese territory. The ends of the conflict then left Japan with two contrasting takeaways. On the one hand, they had achieved a decisive military victory, one that brought honor and prestige on all of Japan and especially on its leaders. On the other, the West was still watching, and Japan was not yet able to shake off their influence. This international order oh, went unquestioned for another decade, until the Russo-Japanese War shook up everything the West thought they knew about the balance of power in Asia. 
We've already covered this in a separate War of Graphics video, but to summarize, the war was fought over dueling Russian and Japanese influence in the Korean Peninsula and Chinese Manchuria. This saw Japan enter into a defensive pact with the British before attacking the Russians alone and gaining a decisive, albeit costly, victory from which a treaty, mediated by the United States, ceded Russian territory and interests to Japan. On the world stage, the impact of this sequence of events cannot be overstated. Japan had honored an alliance with one Western Empire, defeated a second in battle, and gained an equal seat at the negotiating table with the third. Although the circumstances of the final peace treaty left Japan responsible for its own war debts, it also granted Japan authoritarian rule over Korea, setting off a wave of expansionism that would persevere throughout World War I. By the signing of the Treaty of Asai, Japan had not only dramatically increased its territorial holdings, but it had gutted Chinese sovereignty in advance of what would almost certainly turn into later conquest. In retrospect, the Great War was a moment of reckoning for every world power. War was no longer an opportunity for dukes and archdukes to dance on their ponies and direct infantrymen in neat formations. Instead, it would be a business of absolute brutality. Pandora's box had been opened, and it would be impossible to stuff anything back inside with even the slightest hope of a return to the way things were before. For Japan, the war produced one thing above all else information. Information on the major powers as military and logistical capability. Information on the shifts and changes throughout the international order. And information on Japan's current status within that order. Even prior to the Treaty of Versailles, Japanese political leaders were already considering the possibility that total war was the way of the future. If Japan's future wars of expansion were going to be fought under that same devastating set of rules, then Japan would need to be reorganized top to bottom to leverage the archipelago's limited resources and manpower in hopes of victory. Japan had gone out of its way to study the other major powers' its own wartime mobilization strategies and used that knowledge to guide the formation of Japanese society. Though the world, and Japan with it, moved more toward democratic systems of governance in the interwar years, the Japanese approach, in particular, viewed readiness for total war as a core requirement for the empire's continued survival. In a political system that blurred the lines between military and civilian leadership, Japan began to build itself into nothing less than a total war state. Another one of Japan's key lessons came from their observation on their own shifting position on the world stage. The defeat of Germany in the Great War had been, at least on the face of things, an event that strengthened Japan, both through the acquisition of territory and the opportunity for Japan to continue its alliances with the winning side of that war. But at the same time, it was a clear indicator to Japan that even with all the budding empire's military might, if the Western powers chose to bore down upon it, Japan would not be able to defend itself. German forces had been better armed, better trained, better supplied, with a culture that had evolved along the lines of European war-making for centuries. But they had been defeated all the same. So then, not only did Japan need to shift its thinking toward a future in which total war would be commonplace, but it needed to dramatically upscale its own abilities in order to stand a chance at victory. And finally, the end of the Great War saw Japan's geopolitical standing shift in a number of ways. Japan's closeness to the other Allied powers in the late 1910s had never really been about any Western affinity for Japan, but rather based on unity around a common enemy. With that enemy gone, Japan's attempts in the interwar years to gain racial equality at the League of Nations were consistently unsuccessful. A long history of anti-Asian discrimination informed the United States, France, and the United Kingdom's respective approaches to Japan. All this, not to mention the fresh memory of Japanese victory over the Russians just a decade before, a fundamental violation of the race-based world order Western leaders held so dear. The League of Nations had already begun to move toward an international culture that would discourage wars of aggression and expansion. And with all Western indications being that the rest of the world wouldn't look kindly on Japan's imperial aspirations, Japan took the hint. While maintaining global diplomatic relations, the Japanese shifted their focus toward the Asian continent for the long term. World War I had made Japan aware of one final central issue, one that would cause innumerable headaches for the empire under the best of circumstances and might entirely doom it in the worst. 
Early in the Meiji Restoration, the imperial military expanded at an unheard of pace, with little attention paid to rationing resources over time. After all, wars before 1914 were typically brief affairs, especially in East Asia, where Japan could roll over most opposition that tried to stand in its way. The Japanese war machine of that time was built for a quick, basic process. Mobilize as much of the military as possible, get to whichever flashpoint needed attention, and win quickly and decisively. This all meant that the broader Japanese economy didn't have to bear the weight of an extended conflict. Now, though, Japan was faced with a deeply unsettling reality. It did not have the excess oil, the excess iron ore, the excess material resources that would sustain any long-term conflict. Even if Japan arranged itself into the perfect total war society, that would just lead to a lot of sitting around and thinking about how nice it might be to have the materials to build tanks and ships. And even if Japan did come by the necessary resources, that same pan-industrial mobilization capability was the only hope to sustain a war effort on the scale that Japan was envisioning. International support might have been a possibility from the other major powers, but they had all made clear their intention to continue subtly interfering with Japanese plans of expansion and couldn't be trusted to stay out of conflicts, even just in Asia, especially with the United States holding the Philippines in its own tight grip. In fact, it's worth taking a moment to discuss the United States more directly here, and specifically as an expression of the sort of place that Japan at this time wished it could be. By the interwar period, America was self-sufficient in terms of energy, material production, food, and just about everything else you could think of. They even had rare natural resources and specialized machinery. If America were to enter a wartime posture against the world, for years they would be able to sustain themselves in almost every material area. And they'd gotten this self-sufficiency almost by accident, expanding westward but not finding the bounty beneath their feet until much later. The other major powers, especially France and the UK, had achieved the same ends via colonial expansion. But while the interwar order wasn't explicitly against Japan taking new territory, it would certainly be resistant to the kind of conquest that would put Japan alongside the other great powers. The fight to reshape Japan into a peacetime war economy was a slow, protracted affair. For years, the military wrestled with civil leaders over administrative rights, resource allocation, and a wide range of other backdoor political issues. The first major victory for the war planners came in May 1927 when the Cabinet Resources Bureau under Major General Matsuki Naosuke completed a revolutionary study. The Bureau undertook an examination of Japan's capacity for national mobilization, one that took into account every man, woman, and child in the empire and every single ounce of economic capacity. The plan expected tight restrictions on labor and direct military oversight of every sector from healthcare to transportation to agriculture and more. By 1931, the major findings were as clear as they were bleak. Japan's domestic economy alone could not support a modern war effort. The nation had stockpiled oil and manufactured it synthetically. They had begun mining for resources in their recently acquired holdings, most notably the island of Formosa. But it still was not enough. The solution? Expansion. But that only brought Japan back to its original problem. If the empire reached outward too quickly, it risked finding itself in a protracted conflict, or worse, incurring the wrath of the Western powers. But if it failed to reach outward at all, its highest aspirations would remain just that. The only path forward lay somewhere in the middle. Take just enough territory to acquire just enough resources, to take just a little bit more territory, to take a little bit more resources. In that way, the empire could expand, and if it were properly mobilized, it could even expand fairly quickly. But the rate of expansion would remain contingent on the empire's ability to operate within its checks and balances. At least, that is, until the time finally came when Japan would be ready to grow outward on its own terms. With Korea, Formosa, and its other scattered holdings accounted for, Japan set its sights on Manchuria as the next target of expansion. Hardline extremists within the Japanese military had already been targeting the region for years, with assassinations and coup plots aimed at replacing the region's civilian government. The Kwantung Army, the major Japanese force present in Manchuria, had been operating outside of the control of Tokyo's civilian government, and several military leaders staged a false flag attack on a major rail supply line which gave Japan pretext to invade Manchuria. The central government 
had already been interested in acquiring the territory, but not nearly this soon, as officers within the Kwantung army had sought to force their leader's hand. One day after the attack, the city of Mukden was captured by the Kwantung army at the cost of just two men, and the entire region of Manchuria was overrun within five months. Now governed by the puppet state Manchukuo, the area and its natural resources were firmly in Japanese control. The invasion of Manchuria caused significant issues for Tokyo's leadership, primarily due to the risk of Soviet counter-aggression in the northern part of the region. Luckily for Japan, the Soviets didn't seem interested in intervening. Domestically, a new prime minister, Inukai Tsuyoshi, took power shortly after the incident and attempted to constrain the military's political power, but this ended with Inukai assassinated within six months, and in the aftermath, the military leveraged their power to prevent formation of a new, complete civilian government. However strong the army and the navy were in Tokyo, they were stronger on foreign soil, and from this time to the outbreak of World War II, elements in the Japanese military acted with impunity while in the field. This and other internal concerns over the Kwantung Army's actions led to a temporary pause on domestic mobilization, one that lasted until 1933. However, Japan's movements in China didn't stop there. An incident at Shanghai forced China to grant economic leniency to Japan, and the empire moved into the now former Chinese province of Zhehou, also known as Rehi. This consolidated their territory there. The League of Nations formally attempted to oppose the action, but emboldened by their enhanced capacity for self-defense, Japan left the League of Nations in March 1933. Beijing agreed to a truce that left Japan's new gains firmly within its grip, and Manchukuo was developed into the empire's center of heavy industry, led by companies directly under the control of the Japanese military. China wasn't out of the fight yet. As both of our continued skirmishes and economic measures, the worse equipped nations struggled back against the oncoming imperial tide. Chinese nationalization of silver in 1935 attempted to force even Manchukuo's banks into compliance with the Chinese government due to common use of the silver-backed currency yuan, and British overtures suggested that they might be very interested in collaborating with the Chinese to brace against Japan's expansion. But in the end, even this effort backfired on the Chinese as the Kwantung army was able to lock down finance within the region and move Manchukuo even further outside of China's reach. Japan's run of good fortune nearly came to an end one year later, though, in a one-two punch of domestic turmoil and external threat. To the north, the Soviets had moved massive amounts of troops to the Far East, plus tanks and warplanes that made the Kwantung Army's equipment look obsolete. And in Tokyo, a February coup by military extremists threw the empire into a brief moment of uncertainty. The coup plotters were military hardliners in favor of the full economic mobilization that Japan had been headed toward for decades, and though they were successful in their bid for leadership, it took over a year for them to successfully consolidate their grip over the empire while the Russian bear waited nearby and watched for signs of weakness. Again, Japan was at its same impasse. It didn't have the resources it needed or even the domestic security to face down the major power that threatened it, and to obtain those tools would require military conquest and expansion that could precipitate major power involvement. Imperial planners had worked out some steps that might help with the matter, checking the Soviets through closer ties to Germany, survey more and more of China, and target certain much-needed resources. But how this was going to happen with Japan in yet another scenario that placed their great aspirations just an inch out of reach? Well, there was one way. Japan's continued relationship with China, and by extension, Manchukuo, had been profoundly strained. But it was a relationship in which both nations could still exert mutual influence. If Japan were to break this balance and treat Manchukuo simply as a depot of resources to be mined, the empire could ramp up production capacity and then build their military into the kind of deterrence that would make the West think twice before intervening again. It was a hell of a needle to thread, but Japan's war leadership section were up to the task. The plan they eventually put forth included more than doubled capacity for iron and steel production, 15 times the output of oil, including synthetics, and a price tag of 7 billion yen to get it done. Not only that, but the economy would fall under the direct supervision of a national affairs board with the goal of full economic self-sufficiency by 1941. The plan was radical, politically dangerous, an immense undertaking, and it called for the dismantling of the remaining civilian-run sections of Japan's government. But after more political upheaval and some slight reductions in scope, the plan was accepted in 1937 and formally approved in 1938. An endeavor to fundamentally reshape Japan was now underway, and with military hardliners now in control of the government, that endeavor would not be stopped.
On July the 7th, 1937, imperial ambitions in China came to a head. For months, China had been preparing its own military for what seemed a more and more inevitable ascent into violence, which Japan interpreted as a threat to Japanese interests in Manchukuo and surrounding regions. On the 7th, a skirmish broke out between Japanese and Chinese soldiers at the Marco Polo Bridge, incurring significant losses on both sides. Japan mobilized troops in massive numbers, and both Beijing and the port city of Tianjin fell to the Imperial Army within weeks. The Second Sino-Japanese War was now underway, and though this is a conflict that deserves a war graphics piece of its own, suffice to say that Imperial expansion was swift and decisive. Shanghai fell in an intense three-month battle, and shortly afterward, the Chinese government's seat of power was brutalized in an act that would later become known as the Rape of Nanking. Several other major cities were also captured by the Imperial Army, and massive swaths of territory were secured under Tokyo's control. These events were catastrophic for the people of China, leaving a brutal legacy that still perseveres to this day, and we'll dedicate separate videos to the specifics of the conflict in due time. In context to Japanese high ambitions, the war with China represented a mixed bag. On the one hand, military leaders were forced into a conflict much longer than they had hoped, and as such, they had to raise a full 20 new divisions for emergency deployment and expansion of the army of 60%. Even worse, import and export with the West became much more difficult due to international pressure, just as the need for international supplies for war materials increased. But at the same time, Japan achieved staggering military success and installed a puppet regime across the captured territories that would oversee the extraction of their material resources. Despite reservations, Japan continued a hardline approach to the Chinese regime even after their massive advances. China could meet the Japanese on the battlefield or to negotiate surrender. At home, Tokyo proposed its national mobilization bill, and the consequences were sweeping. Every subject of the Japanese Empire would be required to register their professional and technical abilities, which they would be compelled to use based on the needs of the government. The empire was at liberty to seize land and facilities, expand or restrict factories, and reassign civilians at will. Media would be nationalized, and police schools and educational materials would be aligned to the goal of promoting a great Japanese empire. The bill came at a moment of high patriotic spirit in Japan, accompanied by an annual budget that more than tripled usual imperial spending, and the military was able to successfully force it into law. Factions within the Japanese government did attempt to resist legislation, all too aware of the risk of overextension if Japan continued to fight in China while attempting to be ready for war with the Soviets or other Western powers by 1941. But ultimately, the nationalist fervor of time, plus the deep hold the military had formed on civilian government, was too much to oppose. By this time, Japan was leaning heavily on foreign governments for their imports, especially the United States. That relationship, though, was quickly becoming untenable. During the Japanese attack on Nanking, an American gunboat had been sunk and many of her seamen had been killed. Moreover, the American public and its political leaders were shocked again and again by the Imperial Army's brutal treatment of civilians in China, especially when their aggression is carried out by guns firing American ammunition or planes built from American steel. From the middle years of the decade until 1940, relations between the US and Japan slowly devolved and eventually broke down altogether. But as the Americans left Japan's diplomatic orbit, the Nazis came in to fill the void. In November 1936, Japan had signed the Anti-Comintern Pact with Nazi Germany in a relationship that would persevere after the Germans exploded through Europe in 1939 and 1940. The Tripartite Pact, also signed in 1940, allied both nations as well as Italy, granting each other a partner in case of foreign declaration of war. Though the Nazis and the Imperial Japanese were not close allies, their connection helped Japan and the Soviets smooth over their relationship for a critical couple of years, allowing Japan to focus down its continued enemy in China. The Nazi invasion of Poland, though, couldn't have come at a more inconvenient time for Japan. A harsh year of weather in 1939 had contributed to additional unforeseen resource shortages across the board, and with the inevitable effect of war on the prices of critical materials sourced internationally, Japan was unlikely to be able to fill the production void by paying out of pocket. War elsewhere in the world, though, presented several opportunities. Much like Germany in World War I had been too preoccupied to defend their Far East territories against Japan, so too could the Empire seize any number of holdings in the region or even around the world. On top of that, Western powers were likely to lose focus on supporting China's continued resistance. With inflation rising, material reserves falling, and foreign trade minimal, Japan struck southward toward French Indochina, today comprising Cambodia, Laos, and parts of Vietnam. With France having already been overwhelmed by the Nazis, resistance was minimal, and Japan came to an agreement with Vichy France that while the region would remain administratively French, Japan would gain access to the massive material reserves on the territory. 
This didn't fully offset the ongoing and future trade embargoes coming from the United States, but it was enough to buoy Japan for the times ahead. The empire set its sights on British and Dutch holdings that lay further southward, relying on an eventual Nazi invasion of the British Isles that would, in Japan's best-case scenario, eliminate London's ability to resist imperial advances. This turn of events would draw American troops to the Atlantic, and maybe, just maybe, Japan could avoid that fight as well. As Japan closed in on the territorial holdings that might finally grant itself sufficiency, it did so with a relatively clear view of its own abilities. The war in Europe was now in full swing, and if the attack on British and Dutch territories, now called the Southward Advance, did commence, Japan would have to anticipate the worst. War with Britain and the United States. That was a fight Japan could sustain for two years in its current state, but if it could capture those territories and maintain supply lines to the Japanese mainland, that two-year window could be extended significantly. If the southward advance were to happen, though, it would mutually exclude any war with the Soviets. Japan could only withstand them if it had British and American material support, which of course the southward advance would guarantee as an impossibility. As Japan attempted to find some level of balance in its plans for the southward advance, it continued to suffer from the same resource problems that had been a thorn in its side from day one. Production quotas still weren't where they needed to be, and Japanese civilians were bearing as heavy a load as they possibly could. Into service bickering between the army and the navy was constant in Imperial Japan, and military leaders saw no apparent benefit in putting their differences aside to support Japan's common good. And diplomatically, the United States gave it no sign that they would avoid a war on two fronts, while Japan had also caught murmurings that Hitler may be looking to attack the Soviet Union sooner rather than later. Caught between a rock and a hard place, imperial leaders decided that if the Southward Alliance were going to happen, it would need to happen immediately, and if possible, bloodlessly. This would allow Japan to make their southward gains before the Soviets were brought into the conflict and then swiftly pivot to a north-facing defensive and a possible battlefront against the Americans. There were a mess of details to hash out, contingency plans to be put in place, and still the fleeting hope that international matters in the Pacific could still be resolved peacefully. On June the 22nd, the Germans invaded the Soviet Union, causing even more confusion over what would be the right path forward for Japan. But in the late summer of 1941, the Americans put a stop to Japan's internal debate with a freeze on Japanese assets and a complete cutoff from Japan's supply of American oil. Though the Americans had hoped that this would stop Japan's southward advance, they had precisely the opposite effect. With the true lack of any other options to obtain material resources, Japan had only one way forward defend the North from whatever Soviet advances may come, and take everything they could in the South, no matter what force was necessary. Knowing this would draw the United States and Britain into the conflict, Japan began preparations for a preemptive strike on both powers by the end of November 1941. It's crucial to note here that even as the Japanese military planned invasions into Malaya and the American-held Philippines, their internal doctrines and discussions still seem to think of these acts as survival measures. In fact, the Japanese Navy minister referred to them as final measures for survival and self-defense to be taken if diplomacy with the West did not achieve any final breakthrough. Internally, Japanese leaders were still fully aware of just how destructive, just how much of an uphill battle a war with the West would be. Japan pushed off its deadline to commence the southward advance as long as its inter-service battles and resource depletion would allow. And both Japan and the United States did try to find some sort of non-violent resolution, but none came. On the 8th of December 1941, Japan launched a near-simultaneous attack on Pearl Harbor, the Philippines, Guam, Malaya, Thailand, and Hong Kong. From here, the events of the Pacific Theater of World War II would see Japan expand further across Asia and the Pacific, trying desperately to gather the territory and resources that it needed to prevent its own war effort from flaming out. Whether or not it ever came close to reaching equilibrium, we won't ever truly know. But in the end, Japan's great gamble would fail, the war would be lost, the empire would fall, and with it, Japan's ambitions of ever reaching true self-sufficiency on its own terms. Of all the lessons that we can learn from Japan's preparations for the Second World War, perhaps the most striking is the sheer inevitability of it all. For much of the 1930s and the early 1940s, Japan was regarded as an insane nation by the West, one that made irrational choices and pursued unrealistic goals for reasons that Western thinkers couldn't seem to understand. But when observing Japan's core issues and its escalatory response step by step, it's much easier to see how one step led to the next and the next 
and the next. We obviously couldn't cover every twist and turn of Japan's internal turmoil in the interwar years, certainly not in a video of any reasonable length, but even in this distillation of history, it's clear that no matter what else Imperial Japan may have been, it wasn't insane. At the close of the First World War, Imperial Japan knew its goal, to be recognized as a self-sufficient, legitimate power on the world stage. It also was acutely aware of the factors opposing it, an internal lack of crucial resources, and an international disdain from Western powers disinterested in welcoming a new Asian empire into their exclusive club. In the end, it was the attempt to reconcile Japan's goals with its constraints that ultimately led to escalation, first in regional expansion, then diplomatic breakdown, and finally, war with the West. That isn't to diminish the horrific impact of Japan's actions on Asia and the world before or during the war or the millions upon millions of lives that were trampled underfoot in the process. But every atrocious act throughout history is in some way rational from the perspective of its perpetrators. And so too is Japan's charge towards self-sufficiency. On the eve of Japan's ultimate attack, after both the army and the navy had agreed that the South would advance and the strike on Pearl Harbor were about to commence, a Japanese staffer at central headquarters in Tokyo penned the words, At last, the arrow leaves the bowstring. And for all of the carnage of World War II, for all the shock Japan's attack caused the West, the situation was fundamentally different from Japan's perspective. The arrow left the bowstring, yes, but only after it had been drawn back so tightly that the tension could only be resolved in one way, whether for the best or for the worst. The arrow would let fly.